um, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. David Hilliard is a, is a uh, on-site colleague of mine at the ARUP Laboratories. Uh, Dr. Hilliard is a professor of pathology at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Uh, he's currently the Director of Molecular Infectious Diseases at the ARUP Laboratory. And uh, I think it's, uh, he's certainly an expert in uh, microbial uh, uh, pathology, genetics, viral diagnostics. Um, and uh, uh, he has been leading the effort at the ARUP laboratories in terms of development and implementation of molecular testing uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, David, um, welcome. To the program, and I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Carl, and thank you, Tim. Um, Tim, that's a wonderful background uh, into some of the material I'll be presenting today. What I'd like to accomplish today is to be able to give some of the um, approaches that people have taken to determine sensitivity of testing, the analytic sensitivity of tests, what's out there, what are some of the issues, and um, where are we going to be going forward with this. And the timeline that I'm starting with illustrates another important point, and that is uh, we've seen the problems of emergency use scenarios before and the less than perfect rigor statistically and otherwise for understanding our tests. Um, and then on the timeline, you can also see that we still have flu viruses that are circulating and an urgent issue really is our preparation for sensitive detection of co-circulating COVID-19 and flu, RSV, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just COVID that we need to apply these tools to, but it's probably tests that can detect the co-circulating viruses. So the issues have been well uh, introduced in terms of uh, what constitutes a clinically sensitive test, the population that you test, the time from exposure to sampling, the method of collection, the analytic sensitivity. And I can't wait for this afternoon to hear from the speakers how different uh, an anterior nasal versus a mid-terminant versus a nasal versus an oral versus a saliva. And does it depend on how you do use a dry swab in the mouth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what the total contribution is to picking up or not picking up positives in a given clinical uh, population. But we'll focus mostly just on analytic sensitivity for the next few minutes. So the points have been made so brilliantly about um, how you can get into trouble uh, with wrong populations being tested and poor statistics. This slide simply just illustrates that we have all of these sample types and we have these issues of the time of progression of a given individual or population of individuals and how differences in test sensitivity will really make a difference as you perform that test in these different settings. This uh, slide also illustrates uh, the notion of the time span. And, you know, there's, there's lots of unfolding scenarios, uh, including getting workforce back uh, to work and testing individuals over time periods, not so much just the diagnostic testing, uh, you know, where was the individual in the stage of disease, but, you know, what, what are we, what is business going to do? What are, what are commercial entities going to do in terms of testing sequentially over periods of time? And this slide clearly illustrates that uh, as we do a first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth test, we are gonna have very, very different uh, scenarios in terms of what viruses there to be detected. So, why don't we just have a simple answer to the analytic sensitivity test from a practical perspective? Why not just use the most sensitive test? Uh, 
And for this, I'd like to thank uh, AMP for sharing a couple of slides that appeared uh, a week ago in their town hall, which sort of cut to the chase for me very, very strongly. And that is we have supply shortages. We all know about this. And this has dictated what tests we have available to use. And it's been dynamic over a period of time. The notion that for academic and community hospitals, healthcare labs, that 57% of them are running three or more tests is an indication that within that bin, there are going to be tests that have non-ideal performance characteristics for given populations at different points of time in testing. So also as part of that survey was an indication of what are the most commonly used tests. And I think uh, individuals listening to this presentation are familiar with most, most of these from uh, the large big box instrumentation that they likely had available. Uh, and then some of the point of care tests, uh, the Cepheids, uh, the biofires, et cetera, which aren't mentioned on the slide, but surely are very, very impactful now. And uh, a variety of laboratory developed tests, in fact, at the top is, is very, very interesting to me. So in this setting of emergency use, clearly we have not been able to go to the mat and do the things that we normally would have done. And at the simplest level of a statistic, memory of statistics is the fact that as we're doing this and we get to very, very low limits of detection, uh, we need, and, and as we're trying to predict a 95% com confidence, we are driven by the demands of, and the realities of the Poisson distribution and side by side with that, we have a situation in which whether you're doing an original EUA or doing uh, what we sometimes call an EUA light, uh, uh, Kirk of February 29th, where you have uh, 30 positives, 30 negatives, you do replicates, uh, you go uh, a little bit above the determined LOD, however you did it, whether it's replicates of 3, 4, 5, 6, 12, and then you confirm a little bit above that with 19 out of 20 to give a 95% confidence. These were necessary but very, very imperfect approaches, and so we really don't have a highly accurate uh, knowledge of the comparisons of COVID test sensitivities at this point in time. So this is data that came out fairly early, and I like this data because it shows in ascending order, or I guess you could call it descending order, the sensitivity test, ascending the number of copies per mil that the test will be able to pick up. And again, a lot of the tests that are in use here, what's really striking about this is that this covers uh, more than three orders of magnitude in test sensitivity. That's really remarkable that all of these tests with such different sensitivities are out there in common use out of necessity. What's even more confusing is that when we go to just look for the data on LOD, we sometimes only see it in copies per reaction, and then we need to sort of calculate back. And I think, as was discussed a lot uh, through AMP's CHAMP, we have the other barrier to comparability, and that is the TCID 50, which are reported by Roche and Hologic, where we can understand probably the differences between Roche and Hologic, but not so much the comparative sensitivity to other tests. So the traditional approaches and the rigor that needs to be brought to bear the Tim O'Leary rigor that needs to be brought to bear is basically intrinsic to the traditional FDA approach that wasn't available in now and has been applied to just all kinds of uh, viral pathogen studies. Not listed at all as a possible approach on this slide is the notion that you would just take 30 positives, 30 negatives, or 60 positives, 60 negatives, or 100 positives and 100 negatives unsorted for their viral load and go ahead and have some sort of a confidence in comparative test uh, sensitivity. However, 
doing that with the knowledge of crossing thresholds, which in the absence of validated uh, um, uh, quantitative information, but is a very, very good first pass guide to what the quantity of the virus is, allows us to either look across the spectrum of vial concentrations as a sample set to compare tests by or within a spectrum of low viral concentrations. The argument being there that, you know, this virus generally 80% of the time has very, very high viral loads that are very unlikely to be missed by maybe any of the tests at a given cutoff at least, uh, and that concentrating on these lower load samples is really where we would best get good information. Um, and then finally, making predictions based on established LODs looking at relative crossing thresholds with or without confirmatory testing. So I'll give you an example. Here's a distribution of crossing thresholds for Roche and Hologic Panther Fusion, um, 5,000, more than 5,000 for Hologic, uh, more than 500 for Roche. And as a first approach, then, how about looking at highs, mediums, and lows, a distribution, and then doing the correct statistics on that? And this is an example of a study that came out, you know, quite early, uh, evaluating uh, Cobos and Panther, and the discrepant specimens totaled, um, I believe it was 13 or 14 in this case. There was a total number of specimens in this study of 127 out of a larger population, and you can see that for these tests that have now been established to uh, have, you know, quite close uh, performance characteristics that the number of discrepants went almost equally both ways. There were no discrepant samples beyond a crossing threshold of 34, so then, uh, you know, at some level of statistical analysis, could one come to the conclusion that everything that had a crossing threshold of 34 or earlier might be a uh, sample population or a percentage of samples that would be picked up reliably by these two assays. So what about focusing more on low positive samples? So here is a distribution of the hologic samples, their crossing thresholds, and sort of percentages down here of those that fall uh, later than 32%, later than 33%, later than 34%. And so the advantage of calling out uh, these samples and then doing comparative testing is that we're testing these many low positive samples, and therefore we may have larger numbers of samples and potentially more accurate information. A concern for the design of any of these studies, of course, is what is this range going to be? Uh, do we uh, have enough confidence if we're going to compare this to another test based on its LOD or some other study that uh, collecting samples uh, at uh, a crossing threshold of 34 or 32 would be appropriate? Now, prediction based on crossing threshold, I think a lot of us are doing this kind of uh, daydreaming about it. Some people are using it very, very uh, concertedly and practically and seriously in their studies. But the notion here basically um, focuses on the following. If we have, for instance, a test that uh, has a LOD, of, let's say 100, and at the LOD of 100, it's established that uh, the crossing threshold, the average crossing threshold in the given assay is 36, could we then um, make the assumption that if this is 100 copies per mil, then this population uh, would be, uh, a, if you had a test that had a, uh, an LOD of 200 copies per mil, then you would have a Poisson distribution around these. This would be near the cutoff of detection, and on and on, 200, 400, 800. And therefore, be able 
to with the confidence of the limit of detection of test B being able to predict how many of these samples would come up uh, or not. And so that, in fact, was the basis for analysis for a study that was done very recently in which the Abbott M2000 test, which has a limit of detection of 100 copies per mil, and uh, on this graph has a 95% confidence, was compared based on crossing threshold predictions to several other tests uh, in an effort to predict what percentage of uh, samples in this population would be missed by these tests. So clearly, this is sort of really going out there making these kinds of uh, predictions, but it's an interesting way of beginning to look at things and raises the question, and I think for me, the certain yes answer that we need to be doing this uh, in combination with confirming uh, these predictions. And so basically taking this approach and then doing a retest of the samples, excuse me, doing a retest of uh, retest of the samples falling into the prescribed bin would be another approach, certainly with much much higher confidence. So um, that's the kind of study that we recently did, uh, and I'll just cut to the chase very closely. I know we're running a little short on time here, but basically we took a retesting bin based on predictions. In our case, we were concerned that the CDC test would be the least sensitive the test that was available to us within a testing group, an advisory group here in, in Utah. And we first retested a subset of 52 patients uh, in a setting where we had predicted based on crossing thresholds that we might miss uh, 8 or 10 or 12 percent of samples. But in fact, when we did the retesting, we only found one sample missed, uh, a 1.4 percent of the total population, really making us feel much more comfortable about the CDC test. We expanded that based on this data to include a set identified by Hologic, the first one was uh, identified by the rest crossing thresholds, and got essentially the same answer. And so, Tim, I don't know what the statistics would be on this, but uh, you're welcome to look at it uh, at any time and weigh in on this. Uh, I think it makes a point, however, that you don't, based on the crossing threshold uh, predictions, uh, necessarily um, get the right answer. That would be strongly predicted ahead of time. The second example is to take a test much closer to the test performances and LODs of the Hologic test, and that's the Thermo Fisher assay. We did that again and showed that, in fact, uh, it was even closer, had, but had a very, very similar percentage of missed uh, sample prediction uh, compared to the CDC assay and then compared it to another assay that was being run in the state, and that uh, was the Kaidel assay. And in this case, based on testing 142 samples, in fact, a high percentage of them were missed. So uh, the, the questions for these kinds of approaches, therefore, are can we take with uh, intervals that we've qualified by this kind of approach, can we take the approach of saying any test that is more sensitive than certain cutoffs, we, can, we would have a high uh, probability that other tests that are even more sensitive would also perform well, and on the other hand, tests that are less sensitivity would be at even greater risk for missing positives. And I just want to finish by um, something else, and that is to raise the question, what kind of gating do we have out there? We're not normally doing this kind of testing, um, and, but we do have proficiency samples. And what kind of information could the proficiency samples give us about our test? This is from the QCMD proficiency sample. Uh, this is past its a time where we're allowed to talk about this kind of data. And what's interesting about QCMD is that it has uh, 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 determined by 
a droplet digital PCR uh, copies per mil. And so what I posted up here is just the crossing thresholds that we got on the Roche instrument. And I will tell you that based on what we understand about this instrument and the copies to mil, this is a very, very close correlation. So could you use this as sort of a surveillance uh, piece of information to predict this? Could you use this if you don't, you don't have the kinds of uh, resources in terms of well-defined samples to give you at least an initial guide for how your test is comparing and maybe how it compares to another test that you're using in the lab? So I'll just finish up very quickly by saying here's a distribution, not a contemporaneous distribution, but a distribution of crossing thresholds for COVID and for flu A. Uh, there are really high viral loads for COVID. We knew that already. It's, it's higher in this distribution set than it is for flu. But the key question is, what are we going to do in the fall? And our uh, advisory group, when we ask each other, uh, what should be we, we be working on now? Everybody just says, we need to start working on the scenario. I'll just leave you with a few of these references uh, that you can look up to sort of see uh, what information we have about co-circulation at this time. But just finish with uh, a set of resources that have been amalgamated here, both point of care test and sort of high throughput kinds of tests, their turnaround times, their complexity, uh, the shift times, their potential capacity. Because I think many of us think that as we're talking about sampling and analytic sensitivity for just COVID right now, we're going to really be talking about this in a greater context come the fall. And with that, I would like to thank BioInsider and, uh, and all of my colleagues for their many consultations and especially the ARUP team. Thank you. David, thank you for that really excellent summary and presentation of, of data. Um, I'm going to ask you just one uh, question before we move forward, and that is uh, sort of as uh, implied in your final slide uh, or next to final slide, um, do you anticipate that um, um, there will be um, essentially a multiplex, multi-pathogen respiratory virus panel uh, testing approach that, that the uh, uh, physicians and other healthcare providers will be uh, wanting uh, as we shift into the autumn uh, with, uh, you know, respiratory viruses spanning from uh, shall we say mild symptom coronaviruses through COVID to flu to metanumavirus, adeno respiratory syndrome, virus, uh, respiratory syncytial virus? Yes, wanting for sure, needing, uh, I think almost certainly, and uh, formatted on platforms that can do high throughput by looking with many floors, but constrained by the fact that in the traditional uh, multiplex PCR single tube assays, the number of floors uh, that you can use is limited. You need an internal control, you need COVID, you can join together the different targets into a single floor, and then you run into difficult, uh, which child do I like the most? Uh, it, flu A and flu B together, there's differences in identifying a flu A and flu B in terms of antibiotic, uh, antiviral resistance testing, and then RSV, you know, is important. It's not just pediatric populations. We're seeing more and more of it in adult populations. So it's very, very challenging. And, uh, but being able to do it on a single instrument, uh, at high throughput with very, very rapid turnaround time should be our goal. Okay, great, thank you. Well, David, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. And uh, to the audience, we're now gonna move to our next uh, presentation.